Welcome back. We'll start discussing the non-neoplastic esophageal diseases. By the end of this lecture, you will be able to identify the most common non-neoplastic esophageal diseases in the context of clinical presentations and investigations. To describe the pathology of the gastroesophageal reflux disease and hiatus hernia, to describe the pathology of achalasia and esophageal diverticuli, to describe the clinical features of these diseases, to select the suitable investigation for patients suspected to have these diseases, to outline the different methods of their management, and to outline the management of upper GIT bleeding due to esophageal viruses, to outline the management of esophageal perforation. The first disease is the gastroesophageal reflux disease. This disease affects all ages, but most common after 40. About 10 to 20% of people suffer from reflux symptoms, and up to 7% of any population will have daily symptoms. There is no difference between the incidence in male and female, and uh, one of the very important complication, what is called Barrett esophagus, the prevalence of Barrett esophagus is more common in white adult males. Very important to differentiate between physiologic reflux and the pathologic gastroesophageal reflux disease. The physiologic reflux is not a disease, it occurs postprandial, short lived, and usually there are no associated symptoms with no nocturnal symptoms and no nocturnal augmentation of symptoms. The pathological reflux disease, we have associated mucosal injury responsible for the symptoms of the patients and also there is associated nocturnal symptoms. We know that the esophagus is a muscular tube having a function to convey food to the stomach by peristalsis. At the lower end, there is what described before as physiologic sphincter. It is not anatomical sphincter. Its contraction coordinates with the esophageal peristalsis. It relaxes to allow food to enter the stomach and to prevent reflux of the stomach content into the esophagus. This sphincter mechanism having many components, the most important is the lower esophageal sphincter. We have also the diaphragm having what is called pinch cook mechanism, the smooth sling muscle fibers of the gastric cardia, the acute angle of his at which the esophagus enters the stomach, the flutter valve effect of the intra-abdominal pressure on the abdominal esophagus, which is about 2 to 4 cm, causing what is called luminal collapse. There are many factors affecting the lower esophageal sphincter tone. It could be affected by drugs. Some drugs reduce the lower esophageal sphincter, including the calcium channel antagonist, like nifedipine, nitrate, anticholinergic agent, and oral contraceptives and estrogens. Some foods also contribute to the lowering of the sphincters, like chocolate, fatty foods, onions, and others. Important contributing factors to re relax this uh, sphincter is smoking. The second component what is, which contribute to the reflux disease is the disruption of the anatomic barrier associated with hiatus hernia and the loss of angle of face. Esophageal clearance, an effect of the peristalsis of the esophagus to antagonize and to clear the esophagus from the acid reflux coming from the stomach. 
Delayed gastric emptying also contributes to the development of gastroesophageal reflux disease by increasing the gastric volume, increase the frequency of reflux and the amount of gastric fluid available to be refluxed. Delayed gastric emptying results from pyloric stenosis, gastric outlet obstruction, and after vagotomy. Hiatal hernia, which was discussed before as a major factor for development of gastroesophageal reflux disease. We have four types according to the site of the gastroesophageal junction. Normally, we have the gastroesophageal junction lying below the diaphragm. If it slides and becomes in the chest, this is called type 1 sliding hiatus hernia. In type 2, this junction remains in the abdomen, but we found part of the stomach or fundus herniates through the hiatus to the chest. This is called the paraesophageal hiatal hernia. In type 3, we have the combined type, which means that we have sliding and paraesophageal hiatus hernia. In type 4, there is herniation, but for an organ other than the stomach. In 90% of cases of fatal hernia, the type is sliding type. As described, the gastrogel junction is drawn up into the chest with each peristaltic contraction. The lower esophageal sphincter becomes defective and reflux of acid peptic stomach content into the lower esophagus. 10% are of type 2, paraesophageal, what is called also rolling hiatus hernia. The junction remains below the diaphragm and a bulge of the stomach fundus herniates through the hiatus beside the esophagus. This case presents with pain or dysphagia, but not reflux. Hiatus hernia occurs in adult and some of the predisposing factors are smoking and obesity. It may be congenital, presenting in early infancy. It, it is common more in female and in old age. Considering complications of gastroesophageal reflux disease, reflux causes acute inflammation, what is called esophagitis, at the lower end of the esophagus, and if this reflux is severe and persistent, it results in mucosal destruction, what is called erosive esophagitis. Continuation or progression of this erosive esophagitis lead to progressive scarring, fibrosis, and luminal narrowing, what is called stricture, and usually it is about one to two centimeter lying in the lower end. Also, one important complication from long-standing reflux, what is called the Barrett esophagus. The, here, there is metaplasia, which is changing of the squamous epithelium of the normal esophagus to columnar epithelium lying like the gastric mucosa. Barrett esophagus is the only known predisposing factor to adenocarcinoma of the lower esophagus. It was discovered, Barrett esophagus was discovered by Norman Barrett in 1950. It is present in 10% of patients having chronic reflux. So it should be a long standing reflux. And in 10% of this 10% having Barrett it can lead to adenocarcinoma. Patients having Barrett esophagus have chance to get adenocarcinoma 40 times more common than normal person. The clinical features of hiatus hernia. We have to know that hiatus hernia and gastrogen reflux disease are two different diseases. We could have hiatus hernia with gastroesophageal reflux disease, as in type 1, sliding type. And in this case, the patient will present with GERD symptoms like heartburn and regurgitation. We know that 
GERD can occur without hiatus hernia if the sphincter or the pressure in the lower sphincter is defective. The clinical manifestations of gastroesophageal reflux disease, we have three classes or types of symptoms. Typical symptoms may be aggravated by activity, which worsens the gastroesophageal reflux like recumbent position at night, bending over, eating heavy meal or eating meal with high fat content. The patient will present with heartburn, which is a retrosternal burning discomfort. Regurgitation, which is effortless return of gastric contents into the pharynx without nausea, without retching or abdominal contraction. Water brush, which is hypersalivation. Belching. Sometimes the patient, if he presents late, it can present with dysphagia due to structure development. Atypical presentation or atypical symptoms, in some cases, these are called extraesophageal symptoms. And sometimes it could be the only symptoms present for, for the patient, making it more difficult to diagnose this gastroesophageal reflux disease as a cause especially when the endoscopic studies are normal. The patient could present with non-allergic asthma, hoarseness of voice, pharyngitis, chest pain, which is somewhat typical to angina, and it is due to esophageal spasm. And very important to exclude any heart problem by doing ECG and echo. Dental erosions sometimes are the presenting symptoms of the patient. The third category is called alarm signs and symptoms. And this symptom may be indicative of complication of GERD, such as baritosophagus, strictures, or development of adenocarcinoma. Dysphagia, early satiety, bleeding, odinophagia, vomiting, unexplained weight loss, iron deficiency anemia, shocking, and continuous chest pain. These all are called alarming sign and symptom and should be taken very seriously and should be investigated. The diagnostic evaluation of uh, cases, sometimes if the patient presents with classical, what is called typical symptom, heartburn and regurgitation, Without any of the alarm symptoms, we, the, the diagnosis of GERD can be made clinically and we can start the treatment by H2 receptor antagonist or proton pump inhibitor. We expect the response in two to four weeks, but if there is no response, we can change to another type of H2 receptor antagonist to be change to proton pump and to maximize the dose of proton pump inhibitor. If after this maneuver the response is inadequate or there is no response at all, so we have to start investigation in the form of upper GI endoscopy and the 24-hour pH monitoring. Endoscopy is very important and should be with biopsy for any lesion detected. It diagnoses GERD if there is positive esophagitis. This is an what is called objective diagnosis of esophagitis. It is very important also to exclude associated hiatus hernia, Barrett carcinoma, especially in case presenting with dysphagia. It should be mandatory for any patient presenting with alarm symptoms and chronic reflux disease. Sometimes in 50% of patients with GERD, we have what is called negative result, what is called non-erosive gastroesophageal reflux disease. Manometry is to assess the esophageal musculature and the low esophageal sphincter pressure, and sometimes it is done before the operation. pH study is very important to confirm the reflux disease and to assess the extent and severity of the refluxate. 
Barium swallow examination in Trendlenburg position may be necessary to delineate the complicated anatomy. This uh, table shows us the grades of esophagitis. We have four grades according to the area affected by the acid reflux of the lower in the lower esophagus. Grade A, B, C, D. Grade D being the worst type. We have a new technique to diagnose uh, gastrogen reflux disease, which is called the Bravo technique or Bravo system. This is a pH monitoring, but it is uh, without any uh, tubes. It is a capsule attached by the endoscopy to the esophageal mucosa and left inside to record the pH uh, level. And uh, we have to to leave it for 48 hours and it is very valuable in the diagnosis of uh, ref resistant or what is called refractory gastrogen reflux disease. These are the indication of pH study indicated in atypical symptom, patient presenting with atypical symptom and as I said before, the non-responders to medical treatment and in non-erosive gastrogen reflux disease to confirm the diagnosis. Barium swallow for in Trendlenburg position is to delineate the anatomy and as seen in these two films, we can detect very big size hiatal hernia. Again, another uh, barium swallow showing hiatus hernia. And uh, if uh, the gastrogeal junction is above the diaphragm, it is a sliding hiatus hernia as seen on the right side. The treatment of gastrogeal reflux disease, we aim to alleviate the patient symptoms to decrease the frequency and recurrence of the reflux attacks and to promote healing of the injured mucosa and preventing development of any complications. We usually start by conservative treatment in the form of proton pump inhibitor, H2 blocker, and sometimes alginate. Weight reduction, stop smoking, changing lifestyle, and of course to change in diet habits. Elevating the head of the bed at night by six inches. Avoid lying down within three to four hours after meal. Avoid some meals which potentiate or aggravate some medication which aggravate reflux, like sulfurin, alpha agonist, and nitrate sedative, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. All these drugs increase the reflux attack. Wear loose fitting clothing and avoid bending or straining soon after meals. Spicy food and smoking again should be very important to be stopped. And uh, of course, we have to take more frequent small meal. We have treatment of complication if it develops like strictures by regular balloon dilatation under fluoroscopy, but if the stricture recurs several times in spite of regular dilatation, surgery is indicated. Barrett esophagus is very important to be managed and it is uh, if it is associated with dysplasia or not. If Barrett is without dysplasia, we can do laparoscopic fundoblication with regular follow-up. But if it is associated with low-grade dysplasia, we have to excise this abnormal mucosa by what is called endoscopic mucosa resection. If it is associated with high-grade dysplasia, we have to treat it like tumor in situ or carcinoma in situ stage of cancer esophagus and maybe esophagectomy is needed. Surgery for, fun, for gastrogen reflux disease is in the form of restoration of the valve action, uh, action to restore the barrier mechanism. It could be done by open technique, laparoscopic technique, or recently by robotic. 
Here are very important the indication of surgery in cases of gastroesophageal reflux disease. For intractable or non-responder cases, if the, for patient preference, for complicated or contraindication of medical treatment as osteoporosis, if the reflux is complicated by stricture, if the reflux is complicated by Barrett esophagus, in young age, in alkaline reflux, and if associated hiatus hernia more than five centimeters. These are the indication to go for surgery. The surgery is in the form of laparoscopic nissen fundoblication, which is to make a new valve or a new wrap around the lower end of the esophagus to augment the lower esophageal sphincter pressure so it prevents the gastric reflux to go up into the esophagus. This laparoscopic fundoblication is nowadays the operation of choice. And the most important now is to be done by laparoscopy to minimize the effect of the operation concerning the pain and the early recovery. We have different type of fundoblication, whether this wrap or this valve is complete encircling the lower esophagus 360. This is called complete or called Nissen wrap as we see in these figures. Partial fundoblication or partial wraps are in the form of 2P, which means 270. We leave the anterior surface of the esophagus free, uncovered by the stomach. Sometimes we use what is called anterior fundoblication to cover the anterior surface only of the esophagus. This is called door fundoblication. The complication of missing operation are in the form of dysphagia, which occurs in about 10%, and usually it is temporary and resolves spontaneously. If it, it is persistent, as it occurs in 2% of cases, we have to, to do what is called redo operation, to go back and to unwrap the valve and do another new one because usually the dysphagia is due to what is called sleep drap or tight drap. The current reflux is due to loose drap or disrupted drap. Gas blood syndrome is common up to 10% due to retained air and decreased ability to belch. And other complications like early satiety, but usually the gas blood and early satiety are settled with time. Here is very important this drawing representing the causes of uh, failure of fundoblication. We see in uh, A there is complete disruption, there is no more any more rep. In B, we have what is called sleep nissen the wrap now lying down on the stomach. In C, the wrap was uh, done around the stomach, not around the lower esophagus. This is called malposition wrap. And in D, what is called transhiatal herniation. This herniation is not only of the stomach, but the stomach and the wrap herniated up into the chest. We have what is called endoscopic treatment of reflux. These are new techniques, but we have to select it and to inform the patient about the efficacy of each technique. We have four categories. We have the radio frequency application, which is called strata, to increase the lower esophageal sphincter reflux barrier. We have the isofix, what is called endoscopic sewing device. We can inject non-resorbable polymer into the lower esophageal sphincter area, which is called enteryx. And lastly, the Lynx machine or device, which are magnetic sphincter uh, device inserted around the lower end of the esophagus. This is first 
picture show us the idea of the isofix, what is called endoscopic sewing, just to refashion the lower esophageal sphincter by restoration of the angle of his. The Lynx magnetic sphincter augmentation device is, is like the angle check processes used before, but these rings allow the food or the food of bolus of food to pass from above down, but after passing it collapses because of the magnetic force and prevents the reflux going up into the lower esophagus. The patient present with dysphagia because of this uh, structure. This dysphagia is pelvis. It occurs both to fluid and solids, sometimes more to fluids. Bad odor of the mouth, what is called halitosis, because of the retained food. Weight loss in long standing case. Reflux of food into the throat. Respiratory complications are common, leading to shocking and coughing because of the spillover of the esophageal content into the trachea. Esophageal diverticuli may be present at any level because of the lower structure, leading to increased pressure in the esophagus. We have two age presentations young adult and in the old age. There is associated risk of uh, developing squamous carcinoma in up to 5% of cases, but usually after 20 years of the diagnosis, which means that in long standing cases we have to investigate for development of squamous carcinoma. To investigate the achalasia or the case of achalasia, we have to do endoscopic diagnosis by upper GI endoscopy to rule out any occult tumor which is called pseudo achalasia because this case will be very similar to achalasia concerning the symptoms so we have to exclude this by upper endoscopy and to take biopsy Barium swallow examination under fluoroscopy will found typical what is called parodic appearance. Manometry is very important here because it will measure the pressure in the lower sphincter. And as we said before, usually it is above 40. We will find failure of relaxation in the manometry on swallowing and abnormal peristalsis in patients with more chronic condition. Chest X-ray, if done, it will show wide mediastinum because of the dilated esophagus. Sometimes we can find fluid level because of the food and water and air in the esophagus. Some picture of the endoscopy to start with for the diagnosis of achalasia. And as again, we have to stress that it is crucial to rule out pseudoachalasia and malignancy. And as we see in the first picture, the esophagus is full, even if the patient is fasting more than 10 hours. Barium swallow is used for the diagnosis because we have pathognomonic sign, we have special picture, what is called bird beak or bird beak appearance, which is the structure of the lower end. It is smooth, regular, funnel shape, and the most important to lie below the diaphragm. The end stage achalasia, we found what is called sigmoid esophagus because of the huge dilatation of the esophagus from the long standing structure, and we esophagus will be found full of food and air. As seen here in the right side, you can see the fluid level from the stagnant fluid and the food in the esophagus. Manometry is crucial for the diagnosis because it shows the high pressure 
in the lower sphincter exceeding 40 and the most important is the failure of relaxation on swallowing also associated weak or absent peristalsis in the body of the esophagus could be shown in long-standing case with for treatment of achalasia we have to what is called to relieve the function obstruction and to improve the esophageal emptying the treatment is palliation of symptom we can't change the underlying pathology we can't change the absence of or degeneration of the orbach plexus but we can improve the symptom we have four modalities of treatment either by drugs by botulinum toxin by pneumatic dilatation and surgery drugs sometimes are used for early cases and for end stage cases if the patient is unfit for surgery like nitrates and calcium channel blockers the aim is to relax the lower esophageal uh, sphincter but we know that these drugs are associated with some complication or side effects like headache peripheral edema and also the effect is not long standing botulinum toxin is to inject botox in the lower end or the lower sphincter aiming to relax it it was started in 1990 the effect is not to regenerate new uh, or back plexus but to relax the lower sphincter it is injected in the lower sphincter by endoscopy and at the start the effect is reaching up to 80 percent but 50 percent later on have recurrence of symptom within six to one six months to one year so it is a short-term treatment and we need to repeat the injection if possible it causes severe fibrosis and for that reason if the patient is deemed to have surgery it was the surgery will be very difficult because of this severe fibrosis so it appears to be more effective in old age patient and in cases of vigorous achalasia dilatation before in the past we used what's called bougenage for the lower uh, sphincter dilatation before that we use whale board and the patient by himself is the one to make the dilatation now we have what is called graded pneumatic bougie under fluoroscopy and we inflate it for one to three minutes and we pass from one size to larger size up to four 40 millimeters of course there is risk of perforation and we have to follow the dilatation every time by gastrographene swallow to exclude any perforation this picture show the procedure of pneumatic dilatation just to position the balloon in the sphincter and to inflate it and keep it for one to three minutes the results again is short term it is successful at the start in 90 percent of cases but after five years the result decline and the patient will usually require another dilatation it is contraindicated in cases of fatal hernia and in cases of sigmoid esophagus where the diameter is exceeding seven centimeters also contraindicated in cases of associated epiphrenic diverticulum the operation is a surgical myotomy we use what is called modified heller anterior myotomy and it is done now by laparoscopy it is an easy operation with excellent result up to 95 percent success it is contraindicated in cases of sigmoid or mega esophagus exceeding pressure uh, diameter uh, than seven to eight centimeter and in these cases usually we prefer to do esophagectomy because the esophagus is totally atonic without any peristalsis these illustrations show us the laparoscopic hilar myotomy 
where the lower esophageal sphincter muscles are divided and after division because of the resulting reflux iatrogenic reflux done by the cutting of this muscle or by the division of this muscle we prefer to cover or to do what is called associated fundoplication in the form of anterior fundoplication what is called door to prevent the reflux resulted from the myotomy a new technique called the poem just to know it is per oral endoscopic myotomy the idea is to cut the muscle from inside by endoscopy not from outside by laparoscopy this is done by laparoscopy by endoscopy and uh, they claim that the results are extremely good the second Esophageal motility disorder, what is called esophageal diverticulum. We have two types of diverticulum, traction or pulsion. Pulsion results from the increased pressure inside the lumen of this organ, and the traction results from pull up of the wall by external force resulted from, for example, lymph node inflammation and fibrosis. Here in the esophagus, we have diverticulum which occur in the upper third very common called zincar diverticulum it is the result of inferior constrictor what is called the cricopharyngeal muscle doesn't relax in swallowing the resulted high pressure above push the mucosa and lets it to bulge from a weak area called chelian dehiscence so the patient will complain of regurgitation of recently swallowed food, sometimes of shocking, halitosis also. Pharyngeal pouch is easily perforated during endoscopy, and therefore in endoscopy we have to investigate high dysphagia by doing barium study first, and if diverticulum is confirmed, we have to follow by endoscopy. This Illustration show us the position or the site of the diverticulum, the upper cervical zincar diverticulum lying above the cricopharyngeus muscle. And this is very important in surgery, in management of uh, diverticulum. We have to cut this muscle, which is the, the cause of the increased pressure inside the esophagus leading to pulsion diverticulum so after excision of the diverticulum we have to cut this muscle what's called distal myotomy sometimes in a patient if there is not fit we call we we'll do what's called diverticulopexy with distal myotomy just to, to fix the diverticulum high up to keep the, its mouse down endoscopically we have one line the technique to cut the bridge between the esophagus and the diverticulum what is called endoscopically interluminal approach by stapler to join the pouch the diverticulum with the esophageal lumen but it is not done the third what is called epiphrenic diverticulum this is the lower diverticulum lower esophageal diverticulum and it is diagnosed easy by barium swallow endoscopically and it is repaired surgically when symptomatic. So if it is without symptom, the patient, uh, the diverticulum just detected by dye study or endoscopy without any symptom, we can keep it if it is small. But if it is symptomatic, we have to excise and do always distal myotomy. These are the picture of the resection of the diverticulum and uh, we have to cover because as we said we do distal myotomy so distal myotomy will result into reflux and to prevent the post-operative reflux we cover again by what is called door fundo glycation to prevent reflux just few words about gastroesophageal varices Esophageal varices results from portal venous hypertension due to liver cirrhosis, 
usually linked to alcohol abuse or liver fibrosis linked to bilharzis. disease. Uh, we have many other causes like portal vein thrombosis, hepatic vein thrombosis, what's called bad kairi. The pressure rises in the portal venous system, leading to abnormal communication which develop between the peripheral portal circulation and systematic or systemic venous circulation, what is called portosystemic shunt. We have many areas of this portosystemic shunt. The most important is the lower, at the lower esophagus, what is called esophageal versus. These verses sometimes cause massive gastrointestinal upper GI bleeding. So we have the pathophysiology of these esophageal varices, what is called the rule of two thirds. We have two thirds of patients with cirrhosis will get portal hypertension, two thirds of patients with portal hypertension will get esophageal varices, and two thirds of patients with esophageal varices will bleed from this Viruses. This picture show, uh, show us the endoscopic view. For in the left, this is a normal esophagus. In the right, we have huge esophageal viruses, which means dilatation of the veins in the lower esophagus. 50% of esophageal uh, of upper GIT bleeding results from esophageal viruses. Very common. Other causes like gastric varices, gastric erosion, peptic ulcer, but the most important in 50% is development of esophageal varices in cases of portal hypertension. The management differs if a case is elective or if the patient having acute bleeding. We usually treat esophageal varices by two techniques, either banding or sclerotherapy and both are done using endoscopy. This is the end of your recorded session. Please be ready with your questions in the face-to-face -face session. Your face-to-face -face session will start with the simple questions related to the content of this presentation. I'm expecting all of you to be ready. Thank you.